Joining us right now is a very special guest, Senator, State Senator Michael Noland, who is running for Congress to replace Tammy Duckworth in the 8th Congressional District. Welcome to the show. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Doing Thank you well. so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Doing well. So uh, this is exciting. And how's the campaign going so far? It's going very well. Leading in the polls when you're when you're out front, it's always good, right? Exactly. And uh, before we get to the national issues, we've got this big stalemate in, in uh, Springfield right now over the budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bruce Rauner has clearly been intransigent. This is a guy who said... We're not doing anything unless you pass my turnaround agenda. It's not getting him anywhere. Eric Zorn in the Chicago Tribune today told him to fold and get with it and put a budget for it. What's your view on this whole stalemate in Springfield? Well, it's absolutely unnecessary. I think that when you have leaders within your own party, such as uh, Jim Edgar and uh, Jim Thompson, who I, I understand have uh, publicly, for the most part, admonished the governor, asked him to do likewise, to come to the table and try to negotiate, try to compromise. Uh, it just seems to me that the governor really wants a showdown. He doesn't really want to compromise. He just wants to attract attention to himself. And that's a, that's a real problem for the people of the state of Illinois. We need uh, Diplomats. We need people who are really, truly willing to and trying to uh, do the people's business. And um, I believe that our leadership is. I know people may have their opinions about uh, Speaker Madigan and also uh, my president, uh, John Cullerton, but I'll tell you, my, my president, John Cullerton, uh, has been very gracious throughout this entire process, uh, has always availed himself of uh, doing just that, coming to the table and talking uh, through solutions and working with people. So I have great, uh, great faith in our leadership in the Senate, um, he and our uh, President Pro Tem, uh, Don Harmon, are working very hard at the leadership level to try to uh, reach a compromise. But the governor just doesn't seem to want that. So I'm not sure what we can do. It seems like he's running for president almost and wants a showdown like we had in Wisconsin uh, mm-hmm. with Scott Walker so he can get national attention for fighting unions. But it doesn't That's appear exactly to be working. Right. His, his opinion polling is in the tank. Even in southern Illinois, it was uh, 37%. And it's not going to get any better for him. He has to understand that the people of Illinois uh, are well-seasoned in, in, in the sphere of politics. They understand uh, those who are just kind of talking the talk. Uh, they were able to tell, tell the difference between those who are talking the talk and those who are truly walking the walk. And um, that's why they elected a majority of Democrats uh, at the state rep and at the Senate level. Uh, to hopefully work out a compromise with a governor that they believed wanted to, uh, you know, work instead of play. Speaking, and uh, unfortunately, they don't they don't see that at this point. Speaking of of wor- not not working and playing a lot of games, the Republicans in Congress right now you're you're trying to win and, and enter that arena. What a mess mm-hmm. that is with this fight over the speakership. What are you looking back and knowing? that you very well may, may be going to Washington. What do you, isn't that scary to you, the mess that the Republicans have made of that city? Well, in a sense, yes. So when you look at this, and I think that uh, Paul Ryan had, had really stated it, uh, well, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with the man's politics, to be sure, but when he said he didn't want to be the third log on a fire, I thought, that was a very uh, apropos statement. I, the, the, the Republicans are just uh, setting the town on fire and not in a good way. Uh, they're really trying to burn down the house with just this politics of no and um, obstructionism. And I, I, I realize that that may be the environment that I'm asking to be sent into. But I will tell you this, as long as we send strong Democrats to Washington, uh, not only from the 8th Congressional District, which I uh, hope and expect to represent, uh, if we win back uh, the House uh, this time, we're going to be working out solutions in Washington, just like I know we can in Springfield as well. And they will be reflective of the will of the people. People want progress here, not only uh, at the state level, but certainly at the national level as well. And we've made some progress, but we have so much further to go. And the people are telling us that. That's what this, uh, and the commentary that you hear uh, Mm -hmm. surrounding what's happening in Washington and in Springfield, I think, is reflective of that. Have you been a political person all your life? And if not, when did you start getting interested in politics and think, hmm, I think I want to get involved in the process? Uh 
<laughs> well, I can assure you, I never actually expected ever to hold public office growing up. Uh, it happened kind of by accident in 2002 when um, we did the redistricting, and we noticed that it was more of a Democrat district out here, the state rep district. I looked at that and actually offered to help somebody else run for that seat, uh, go door-to-door, something I never realized that's what you actually do. I just thought, well, you know what? I I remember as a kid selling candy door-to-door for our baseball team and being rather successful, and I said, well, that will translate well to a political campaign. Let me see if we can't try that. Uh, offered to do that for uh, the, the individual who was being considered uh, for the Democrat uh, state rep uh, seat uh, back in 2002 from the 43rd district, the old 43rd, and um, uh, that person decided not to uh, to run. So uh, my wife just simply said, "You know what? I'm tired of you, you know, uh, wadding up the paper and throwing it in the recycling bin or yelling back at the television. Uh, you know, you really need to." to do this, and, uh, mm-hmm. and so we gave it a try. We went out uh, first time, didn't win the first time. Matter of fact, didn't win the second time, but uh, then I ran for the Senate, and oddly enough, uh, the people said, well, that's where, where you need to be, and, and so here I am. Yeah, Bernie Sanders lost like a million times <laughs> before he finally, <laughs> before he <laughs> finally went mayor of Burlington, so don't don't feel yeah. so bad. Uh, and yeah. you won, and like Bernie, you, you won. What, right. what would your uh, top priorities in Congress be? Well, we really have to chase after uh, a number of issues. You know, the top three, I'll I'll just tell you what I think those are. I think, first and foremost, one of the things that we can do is we can uh, really try to roll back the Citizens United um, decision and repeal that and do what we can to alter or change our Constitution so we don't, aren't facing this. We're able to really remove this cr- crushing and corrupting influence that money has on our electoral system, on, the, on our process of electing uh, quality individuals to represent us either in Springfield or in Washington. And uh, that's, that's certainly uh, one of the first things I'd like to work on, income inequality, which I think is a result of that. You know, government, there's an important role uh, of government. We have to make it work for the people. We have to make it so that everybody, every man, woman, and child in this great nation of ours has an equal shot at the American dream. And it's just not so uh, right now. Mm-hmm. And I know that we can turn that around. And then, of course, you know, continue uh, strengthening, you know, uh, uh, our access to uh, education, uh, both uh, K through 12, and then, uh, of course, at uh, higher education, making college uh, much more affordable. And uh, fighting back all of those other, you know, the, the traditional issues, you know, we have to, you know, remain strong uh, regarding the uh, right to choose. We've got to be supportive of labor. And uh, having been somebody who voted for civil unions and marriage equality, I know that um, our, our rights uh, of privacy are continually under attack by extremists, typically Republicans and uh, extremist Republicans in Washington. And that's why we need truly progressive uh, representation uh, in in Washington. And I met uh, you at I the really... Human Rights Campaign Dinner, so that was that was great. Uh, how, mm-hmm. how did you enjoy yourself? Yeah. That was a pretty good uh, evening. It was a, a wonderful presentation, and uh, you look at the accomplishments that have been made uh, over the last couple of years, and, and being able to uh, effectuate a Supreme Court ruling that really put this to rest, at least it should be put to rest uh, for, for a considerable amount of time uh, on into the future, um, but realizing that we're still under attack. When you see uh, locals who are refusing to issue uh, marriage licenses uh, for uh, individual, you know, personal religious beliefs, um, you know, I think we, we really still have an awful lot of work to do, even at the federal level, to ensure uh, you know, individual right of privacy, right to choose, uh, that has been um, established uh, not only constitutionally, but of course uh, re- reiterated and re- uh, restated by our Supreme Court. So, you know, it's going to take uh, strong willed people who are supporting uh, individual rights uh, in Washington to make sure that. Uh, that uh, the will of the people, uh, in this case, those who uh, wish to, uh, you know, share their lives with uh, with those that they choose, uh, uh, on into the future. You are in the Navy, and we look around the world right now, and it's more dangerous than it's been in quite some time. You've got Russia behaving badly. Not only did they mm-hmm. annex Crimea, they went into Ukraine and caused havoc, and now they're in Syria. You have mm-hmm. a situation where the Middle East is 
is in strife all around. Um, and China, and the they're, they're building islands to to restrict uh, trade. So there's lots of problems going on right there. So so what is your view in terms of military inven- in, um, intervention and the state of the United States military, and when do you think it's appropriate in some cases to intervene in conflicts? That's a lot of questions, but basically your mm-hmm. overall view of military intervention and the problems that we face militarily in the world today. Sure. Well, I will tell you, as a former uh, sailor and uh, a Navy man, and I, I want to make clear to the audience that, uh, you know, I was a non-combatant. I served uh, as a hospital corpsman. And as a matter of fact, I, I've served stateside. I fought the battle. I'd like to tell people I fought the Battle of Great Lakes. So oh, I thought uh, you were going to give us a gi- I thought you were going to give us a Jim <laughs> Webb story and say, oh, I, no. No, OK. <laughs> uh, never in Vietnam, never served in harm's way. Um, so but uh, nonetheless, uh, I did serve uh, during Operation Desert Storm. And uh, one of the things that I realized at that time, that that conflict itself, was basically an exchange uh, of blood for oil, you know? And it's our energy policy that so often uh, gets us into uh, these uh, quagmires, as uh, Bernie Sander, uh, Sanders has, has mentioned and has called the situation in the Middle East. They are, they tend to be, those quagmires within quagmires, right? Uh, and a reason for that are are somewhat complex, oftentimes related to uh, religious fervor and um, differences of opinion regarding uh, faith. And uh, and not only that, but geography uh, rights to not only uh, uh, land, uh, land space, but also uh, uh, what's underneath uh, the surface, you know, such as oil and such as other uh, rare and uh, important uh, resources. So, having studied, actually, at the University of Illinois, my undergrad degree was in economic and environmental geography, which uh, was basically uh, a uh, study of the distribution of natural resources. And what I've come to find out time and time again, and I think what we all come to find out, whether or not we uh, study this at the university level or not, is that this is really, ultimately, a uh, contest uh, for those resources. And so what the Navy's mission has always been to keep the sea lanes open uh, for commerce um, to support our national security, our our nation's best interest. So I would tend to take a a similar view uh, and always asking, why are we there? How is this in our best interest? And if it's China that's building uh, offshore uh, islands that are going to somehow inhibit the flow of commerce in South China Sea, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to look at that and ask, well, why is that? And how is that detrimental to uh, our national policy? If it's something that's happening in the Middle East, whether it happens to be with ISIS or it happens to be Al-Qaeda or some other faction or it's in Afghanistan, I'm going to ask again, why is this in our national, national best interest to, to involve ourselves there? And I see time and time again it has to do ultimately uh, you know, with our, and most, most often, I will say, not always, but most often, having to do with our energy policy and our over-reliance on oil, uh, whether it happens to be foreign oil. And, you know, we, we are also dependent on domestic oil. And I understand, you know, because of our, our need to protect our interests overseas or protect, or to, let me just say, to limit our, our need to be involved in conflicts overseas, we do want to develop um, uh, greater resources domestically. But I will say this succinctly. Mm-hmm. I think the best policy, and we can, we can choose either a hard path or we can choose a soft path. The hard path is to continue our over-reliance on fossil fuels and oil. Our soft path is to pursue conservation and alternative energy uh, resources uh, to rely on on into the future. That will create a more sustainable economy, more sustainable ecology, and also a, uh, a, a, a more secure national foreign policy as so, well. So, so uh, climate change, addressing this is going to be high on your agenda. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, you know. 90, so, I, so, I, so I take it you're not getting any money the, from the Koch brothers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, not any time. Uh, I don't see that. I was going to say not any time soon, but I don't see that at all. Quite frankly, um, you know, I uh, I have a hundred percent voting record this year with the Illinois Environmental Council. Very strong in environmental issues. It's where I cut my teeth coming into uh, 
politics originally. I served on the Elgin Image Commission and helped develop a, a comprehensive tree policy uh, here for, for the uh, city. That was ever before I ever planned on running for office. And, um, you know, it's just environmental issues and taking a more sustainable view uh, as to energy policy and environmental policy is uh, something that the voters of uh, this district certainly can expect from me, and as well the Koch brothers could expect from me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Final, fi- final uh, question: What your views on mm-hmm. health care? Uh, Obamacare is an improvement, but uh, I'm for single payer. What would you? What, what mm-hmm. do you? What, what? What's your view of the current health care system, and and how would you improve it? Or happy with the way it is? Or uh, what, what, what's your take on that? Well, not happy with the way it is, and as a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that one up because because it's very uh, ultimately we all have a need for access to quality health care. I carry the bill currently calling for universal single payer universal health care in the state of Illinois, and I will continue to push for that in Washington. I admire the progress that President Obama has been able to make with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I believe it's a worthy experiment, but. Uh, thus far, the experiment is falling short of expectations. We have probably as many, we have more people who are covered. There's no doubt about that. But we have yet, unfortunately, still uh, too many, and uh, certainly um, more than we expected at this point, who are still either uninsured or underinsured. And I, uh, you know, I look to other industrialized nations of the world that have uh, single payer, and most do single payer universal health care. And there's a good reason for that. It's, uh, it makes it for a more stable economy overall, and uh, it also creates a healthier uh, economy because more people are able to, to stay at work and to continue to be productive members of uh, their given uh, economies and their societies. And I think that uh, really that's the direction ultimately that we will go, and I am uh, going to be uh, a voice for that uh, as I, I now um, move from uh, my responsibilities in Springfield to those, hopefully, in Washington. I like your platform. State Senator Michael Nolan, good luck on your campaign. Where can people reach you? Well, uh, nolanforcongress.com. That's our, our website. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, we are uh, in the our Elgin office up at Division Street, 164 Division Street, uh, Suite uh, 104. If people want to stop by it's for, for no reason, please, by, by all means, do so. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to reach out to uh, your listening audience. Uh, you do a great job, Wayne, and we really appreciate uh, uh, the hard work that, uh, that you're engaged in each and every day here on uh, WCPT. Thank, Thank you, you so and uh, good, luck. Have good, yeah. good luck on your race. Looking forward to, to seeing you in Congress. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. This is the Wayne Besson Show on Chicago's Progressive Talk, WCPT. Wayne Besson Show.